When I was 22 years old, um, I became a first-time father. And uh, like when I was 20 is when I got married. So I started really young. And I did. My wife came to me and she's like, hey, we, we should have a family. I was like, okay, let's do it. Well, a little bit about me. When I was 22, I had yet to ever hold a baby. I had yet ever to be really around a baby. Um, they kind of freaked me out because, like, they would say or do, you know, noises. I don't know how to respond to them, so I just, I don't know, like, it's a baby. And so, like, and then they'd scream at you, you know, it just was a weird relationship. And so I was like, I just don't want to be around any form of a baby. And so, um, but my wife and I were like, yeah, let's have, let's have a kid. And so when I was 22, um, our oldest, Logan, came around. Now, uh, Logan was born with club feet. And essentially what that is, is his feet were so bowed, like his case, his feet were so bowed that the bottom of his heels could touch his bottom. I mean, his legs were just so bowed. And so he's had uh, surgeries, and he was in like overcorrective shoes and stuff like that. So now, you probably can't tell that he was born with club feet. But when we finally got to bring him home, about a week or so later, um, he had casts on his feet. So this is Logan. And um, his cast went like from right here or so all the way down to his feet. And um, when we finally brought him home, Nicole had, my wife Nicole, had developed kind of a cyst on her tailbone. And so she was unable to like get up and get down quick and easy. And so I had to play Mr. Mom at 22 years old. Never been around a baby in my life. They freak me out. And so I did what any young guy does. He calls his best friend. And I was like, hey, will you bring your wife? You know? <laughs> and so he's like, sure. And so Joel and Summer came. And, um, you know, everything was going great, you know, just hanging out. And then uh, Logan did what a lot of babies do, uh, went to the bathroom in his britches. And so she's like, baby needs to be changed. And I'm like, oh, I, I'm doing this, I guess. And so I held Logan really close to me like this, because I don't know how you hold a baby, and walked her. There you go. And so um, as I'm carrying Logan into his room, um, I go, Summer, I need your help. And so she's following me along. And I laid him like on the, on the changing table. And, you know, I take off like the diaper straps, you know, what you're supposed to do. And Summer's like, you're doing such a great job. And I'm like, I really am. And so I'm doing all this. And, and so I lift up his legs and I had to hold his legs up with his cast. And it was just kind of awkward and stuff. And so then I saw things you're not... Want, nobody ever wants to see, and so I cleaned it the best of my ability, and, and then I didn't realize something. Babies aren't always done. <laughs> I didn't know that. I thought, like, when you go, you go. You're done, you're done, and no, he, he starts going again, and I'm like, Duh. and I literally scream like a 10-year-old girl. I'm like, no! Ah! I just, I like, I'm like, I don't know what to do. I, I, and someone's like, where are you going? Because slowly I'm backing out of the room. I'm like, I just don't know what to do. And, and she's like, where are you going? And I like leave. I leave like my, inside my house. I go outside. I'm like, I just don't shit. I hear her yelling inside, Jeremy, where are you? And I'm like, I just cannot be here. I felt way over my head. Has there been any parents in this room ever felt you're way over your head as a parent? Like you have no idea what's going on. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to do it. Any kids in here ever feel like your parents are just like, I don't, I don't even know how I'm still around. Like, like you, anybody feel that way? Like that was like, I don't know anything. I was just way, way, way over my head. And so we're going to be talking about um, a guy uh, his name's Eli. We'll get in that here in a minute. But we're talking really about parenting. And, and I really want to lean in at something really quick. You can be a parent without being a parent. I'll explain. You can love kids without them being your own. Okay? You can... You can uh, uh, mentor them. You can pour into them. You can get to know them from a different level than just being their parent. You don't have to be a parent to parent. Does that make sense? And so we're going to be talking about this idea of being a parent and being a great grandparent. And a great is the adjective great grandparent, like to love kids. You don't have to be a parent to parent. And so we're going to be hanging out in uh, 1 Samuel. Now, the Bible is separated in two different parts. There's an Old and a New Testament. We're going to be hanging out in the Old Testament in a, in a book called 1 Samuel. So if you have your Bibles, if you want to flip to that, that'd be great. Um, there's three main characters that we're going to be talking about in this part of 1 Samuel. We're we'll going to be talking about a person named Samuel who, when we first start talking about, is a baby and then eventually becomes a, a boy. So we're going to talk about Samuel. We're going to be talking about a guy named Eli who's a priest. He lives at the temple. And lastly, we're going to be talking 
talking about a woman named Hannah, who's actually Samuel's mom. Now, I don't know if you guys know this story or not, uh, but, but Hannah was barren. Like, she was unable to have any kids. And so she would plead and plead and plead, God, please bless me with a child. Please bless me with a child. I, I, I want to love a child. So much so if you bless me that I essentially, I'll give him back to you that he can work in the church, work in the temple. He can be your servant. And so in, in chapter one of 1 Samuel, we're gonna hang out just for a couple minutes in uh, verse, starting in verse 13. It says this, Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli, remember he's the priest, Eli thought she was drunk. Apparently this happens a lot then. But Eli thought she was drunk, and he says to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Verse 15, not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. I wonder if Eli's like, oh, you know, he did like, Women, you know this look, that whenever you tell a guy what's going on, and they're like, oh, yeah. You know, so I wonder if that was going on. Um, These are insights I pick up from the Bible. Okay, so uh, verse 16. Do not take, she says, do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. So Eli replies, he answers, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And he does. She becomes pregnant. And she follows through, she follows through with what she, she said to God is that once, once she has a child, she will give him back. And that's what happens. After, she, after uh, uh, Samuel is weaned, she gives him back to the church, to the temple. Now, a little bit of uh, history, a little bit on Eli is, I don't know if you guys know this or anything, but Eli had a couple sons. Eli is known to be not a great father. Like, he, he kind of failed as a father, like multiple times, just, just wasn't good. And, and she gave him back to Eli. So verse, verse 26, and she said to him, pardon me, my Lord, as surely as, I, as you live, excuse me, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. And I love verse 28. So now I give him to the Lord. She's trusting God. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. So we're going to jump over chapter 2, and we're going to hang out in chapter 3. What I love about this is that Eli gets a second chance. Eli essentially becomes like an adopted father. He essentially becomes a, a, a foster father. This is not a biological son. He gets another chance. He gets another chance. So in 1 Samuel 3, we're going to read just 11 verses, starting in verse 1. The boy Samuel, now Samuel at this point is somewhere in between 10 to 12, somewhere in there, most theologians believe that he's 10 to 12. So he's a little bit older, a few years later down the road. So the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There are not many visions. One night, Eli Uh, Remember, he's the priest um, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see. He was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not gone out yet. And and, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. I love verse 4. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered. He says, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Anybody like getting woke up in the middle of the night? It's like your thing? Like you're like in, you know, dream world and you get woke up. Anybody enjoy that? I don't see any hands raised. Like nobody likes it. Okay, so for me, um, this happened. True story. A couple, like maybe last week. I'm laying in bed and something wakes me up. I look to my right. My seven-year-old is staring at my wife like this. (laughs) Like staring at her. I go, Paxton, what are you doing? He goes, I don't know. I'm like, go back to bed. Like, what are you doing? And I think Eli's like, like, what are you doing? Go back to bed. Like, leave us alone. We're sleeping, you know, kind of thing. But, but he goes, he says, go back and lie down. Verse six, again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. Eli says, my son, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Verse seven, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. 
a third time. Oh, no. The Lord called Samuel, and it says Samuel got up. And I wonder if he's like, "Uh uh-oh, like, I know I heard something. And like he's, you know, the first couple of times, like he ran, but now he's like, uh, you know. So, so he, he gets up and he looks or he goes and he goes to Eli and he says, here I am, you called me. I love this. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. Verse nine, so Eli told Samuel, go and lie down and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and laid in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Lastly, verse 11. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it about to tingle. So number one in your notes, own it. Number one in your notes, own it. We need to own our faith. Hannah owns her faith enough that she is trusting God. Remember, she's giving the baby to the Lord in care of a father who has failed. Like she's trying, okay, God, you got this. I believe in you. Here's my son. She owned her faith enough. Eli, now Eli, when he, was, when he had his kids at you know, younger age, maybe younger Eli couldn't be who he was as older Eli because Eli was able to show this boy how to respond when God calls to you. He, he owned his faith enough to know when I was here, I failed, but now I'm ready to stand strong. Now I'm ready to respond and to show this young boy what it looks like and how to respond to God. We need to own our faith. Each of us need to grow in our relationship with God. Each of us. Not just the little guys in class over here, down the hallway. Not just the teenagers here on Sunday night. Each of us need to grow in our relationship with God. I wrote a couple things down so I say them clearly. The only way we can help grow our kids' faith is by growing ours. Isn't that good? Everybody say that's good. That's really good. The only way... The only way we can grow our kids' faith is by growing ours. 1 Samuel 3, 8. We're going to jump down this, this, where it says then. It says, then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. The only way Eli could do that is if he's heard that voice before himself. That's the only way. You can only take someone as deep as you've ever gone. Especially in this context, in this way, you can only take someone as deep as you've ever gone. The only way Eli knew how to respond to God, and because he had, he can tell the boy what to do. He can tell him how to respond. Now, I know that there's a lot of us in this room that feel unqualified. I was 22 years old with a kid that had casts and corrective shoes and all that. I felt way unqualified. I'm now 37 years old, I have three kids, and I still feel way unqualified. I'm like, God, how in the world? I tell my kids all the time, like, like I, I've never raised three kids before. Like, I don't, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know, go outside and play. Like, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to say, I don't know how to say it to inspire them sometimes. I've never had a daughter before, I have one, and so like with the boys, like, just go outside with rocks. You know, with Abby, it's like, uh, let's, do tea time, you know, when she was younger. Like, I just don't know what to do. Like, there are times that I feel so unqualified, and I know I'm not the only one. I'm sure there are plenty of parents in here, and not just parents, but grandparents, and people maybe that are parents that aren't parents that feel unqualified and think, like, how in the world can I help somebody know Jesus, know God? In Jeremiah 29, 13, which is two verses after one of the most quotable verses in all the Bible. This is what God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. It does not say when the pastors seek me, they find me. It doesn't say that. It says when you. So in those moments of struggle and not knowing what to do, when you seek God, you will find him. When you seek God, you will find him thing for the teenagers in here don't just wait for your mom and pop to do it sometimes you have to do it yourself how do you grow your own faith how do you make faith your own make time for God 
as, as elementary as that sounds, it is sometimes the most difficult time or difficult thing to do, making time for God. Maybe you need to get up early in the morning and read your Bible or spend time with God in that way. Now, I know some people aren't morning people, so maybe you need to do it late at night. Maybe you need to do it during your lunch break. For me, I wake up earlier than anyone else in the house, and that is when I have my chances to connect with God and, and to start my day off right, reading the Bible. Reading the Bible, getting to know what his voice sounds like, getting to know him. I read the Bible. I go to my chair in my bedroom and I look out this little view that I have and I'm just so thankful and spending time with God, worshiping him. Um, I know I might get kicked off the stage for this, but instead of maybe listening to country music every day, maybe listen to a little bit of worship music, something that fills your soul. Sorry, Brett. Um, something that fills your soul. Maybe, maybe instead of listening to whatever news station that you affiliate yourself with, maybe listen to some podcast about how God loves you and what he wants to do in your life. We need to make time for God. Secondly, get connected. Get connected. Here at Family Church, we do a lot of things well. One of the things that we do best is life groups. Life groups is a great place to go and get plugged in. It is people that are in the same place as you, wanting to know God and draw closer to him. So if you feel like you're just all by yourself, there is people who love you and want to bring you in, if you have yet to be in a life group, to bring you in and love you and show you and help you and pray for you. Life groups. Uh, another place is mentoring. Find a mentor. Find somebody who's been in the trench before you who can give you insight and pray for you and believe in you. Find a mentor. Um, also, we have, uh, at the end of each service, this weekend, we have Starting Point. It's a great place to start. It's a great place to know about our church. Get connected. Lastly, serve. Lastly, serve. Now, I oversee, I'm the family pastor, and so I oversee from birth all the way through high school. It's, it's pretty big. And, um, but, but the thing is, like, a lot of times when we say, hey, it'd be great if we get some people to help, I think a lot of times what people hear is that we need teachers. We don't. We really don't need teachers. We have great teachers. We have teachers that are so good that I don't have to be in every class, every day, every weekend. They teach, and they are amazing at it, and they love your kids, and they love the kids who just walk here. They love the kids. But what we do need is somebody to get down on their level and ask them how their day is. We need people to love kids and just to talk to kids and ask them how math class is going and ask them how much that you like this person or this person, like what is going on in your world, getting to their level and connecting with them. So that's what we need in kids and students. So if you're afraid about being a teacher and have to know everything, no, we don't need that. We just need people to connect, people just to love kids. Now here at this church, we have, there was a big church, so we have a lot of different things to get involved in and serve, um, but also a great place to serve is in your community. How can you love your community or save your community if you don't love? Like we need to serve our community. We need to be a coach, even if we don't know anything about that sport, because kids need to know Jesus. And the best way of knowing Jesus sometimes is just hanging out with somebody who knows Jesus Maybe it's going to the library and just serving and just volunteering. Maybe it's being a part of whatever is going on in our community in Roseburg or Oakland or Sutherland, just being involved and in loving your community because God is a God of serving. The question I have for you is do you know what his voice sounds like? Do you know what God's voice sounds like and are you able to describe it to someone? Now, Jesus gives us kind of an answer in uh, uh, John, in John 10. Jesus says this. He says, I, or excuse me, when he, talking about the shepherd, okay, he's talking about shepherd and sheep. When he, the shepherd, brought out all his own, he's talking about sheep here, so he's essentially saying, when the shepherd brought out all his sheep, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Ten verses later, Jesus says this. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Pastor Paul last weekend talked about prompting. And he talked about whenever you feel this nudge in your heart or in your spirit that God is moving you. Another great place to know what his voice sounds like is right here. 
It's in the Bible. If we truly believe that this is God's word, if we truly believe that God spoke this, this is his voice. So when we're in this place of going, okay, if I choose right or left, I don't know which way to go. But if it's contrary to what the Bible's saying, ah, oh, it's this is God's voice. This is what he's saying. This is what he wants me to do. Another great place to hear God's voice is being around godly people who pray for you and godly parents. Are you able to decipher from the noises around you? I have a friend, his name's Mike. Now, um, about seven years ago, I was at, uh, I like going to basketball games, volleyball games, uh, at the high schools and stuff like that. I like going to football games. Um, wrestling's okay, but um, I, I like just being a part in the community and just doing whatever, you know, is going on. Um, I've been doing that for a long time, and uh, about seven years ago, I went to the worst place ever to go to watch somebody perform in whatever sport they're in. Um, I went to a swim meet. Uh, the reason why it's terrible, I lived in Iowa at the time, and, um, and swim meets are always during wintertime, and so you go in there after uh, uh, you're outside in the elements of minus 30 degrees, and you walk into like this, like this heated pool area, and you have your coat on, you have a sweatshirt on, you have like three other layers, and you're like, oh, this is terrible, you know? And then you're there to see the kid, the one kid swim the one meet at the one time, at the, and it's like for like 10, 15 seconds, you're like, wow, I'm glad I sat here for three hours. Like, it's one of those things. And so I'm sitting by a dad, and his name's Mike. And Mike tells me, like we're just kind of talking, he tells me that he makes a noise, and when his kids hear it, they respond. And so I was like, oh yeah, everybody's got a dad voice. And he's like, no, no. And about two minutes later, his son, who's at the pool deck, and we're about 10, 12 rows up, he walks by, and he goes, I'll show you. I was like, at that point, I probably was thinking about something. I was like, what? You know? And so he goes, sss. That's all he does. He goes, sss. And Drake stops. And he turns around and he looks up and goes, hey, dad. And I was like, what? Like, how in the, like, it is crazy. Loud. There's like three or four other teams there. I mean, it's just a lot of people jumping in the pool. I mean, people are talking. It's just echoey. And I was like, how in the world did he hear that? And he goes, well, you know, I didn't want to be one of those dads that yell for their kids at the grocery store or whatever. So I started to do this because I kind of trained my kids like I trained my dogs. And I was like, Mike, I don't know if that's legal. Like, I don't know. You shouldn't be telling me these things kind of thing. But, but are you able to decipher God's voice between the noises all around you, much like Drake was able to hear his dad's voice? Are you able to decipher from the noises around you? Teenagers, parents aren't perfect. As you can probably tell, I'm an emotional reaction guy. Like I'm just, I get my voice like jumps up, you know, all that. I mean, that's who I am. I'm not perfect, and your parent isn't perfect either. But, but, it's where God has you right now. Serve them. Love them. Show them what Jesus looks like with skin on. Lastly, release it. Release it. Or secondly, I'm sorry, secondly, release it. Um, this is the hardest, hardest point for me. Um, because I think it's the most vital. Kids have to have their own faith. Kids have to have their own faith. Listen, 1 Samuel 3, 9. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, if you have your Bibles, if you want to highlight, if you want to circle the word, if. If you want to point arrows at it, if. And if he calls you. I wonder if Eli... Um, was kind of like, you know, he's woke up. He's like, it's just like, well, how about this? How about if I pray, God tells, you know, I have a relationship with God tells me, I tell you, we go to bed, everything's great. We have a busy day tomorrow. Like, let's get this thing rolling kind of thing. But no, like, I, lo I love what I see here. It says, but Eli wanted Samuel to find God on his own. Eli wanted Samuel to find God on his own. As parents, we have a tendency to do everything for our children, so much so that our children don't know how to do anything. And so they don't even know how to respond to anything. It's like, well, my mom will handle it. I, we don't know how to make our beds. My mom does it. Like, they, they just do everything. Like, our dads, they, they just like, when, when I have an issue with somebody, the dad will step in and take care of it. Like, we have a tendency to do everything for our kids, but our kids end up not doing anything. 
we have to release our kids. I'm looking at my notes here because I want to make sure that I say this correctly because it's a very sensitive topic. But this is something they need to find on their own. But, there's a caveat, there's a, there's a button there. We need to prepare them to hear God's voice. This is something they need to find on their own, but we need to prepare them to hear God's voice. We need to connect with them. We need to talk to them. We need to guide them. Something we do here, um, every Wednesday night, we, this auditorium is full of kids. It's loud. It's obnoxious. Um, we meet here from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. And uh, we do games and we do all those kind of things. But really the games are about in the hour and a half, the 90 minutes, we have about 20, 25, maybe 30 minutes some nights of games. The rest is all about Jesus. We, we do a worship set. We do um, small groups. We do a service and, and all this kind of stuff. And we have kids that walk here. Kids that parents don't attend the church here, but they walk here because they know that this is where they hear of God. This is where they know where Jesus is at. This is where they feel loved. Every Sunday here in the church, at, from 6 to 8 o'clock, we have students, um, teenagers, middle school and high school. Last week, we had 66 high school and middle schoolers in this building. And it smelled like it, by the way. I just want to throw that out there. It really did smell like it. Um, which, you know, and, and it's, it's interesting. You know, they haven't learned some things yet. Um, anyways, but we had 66 high schoolers and middle schoolers here. And the reason why these kids are coming is not because of the games and not because of the food and all this kind of stuff that we have. The reason why they come is because this is the place they hear about God. This is the place where they feel loved. We need to be preparing them a place to go so they can hear about God. Because as much as I love public schools, they don't hear it there. And as much as I love friends, they, they probably don't hear it so much there. Where are they hearing about God's love for them? We have services that are geared toward them, for them. Here's the thing. This is why it's really sensitive. When our kids are little, we tell them, brush your teeth. Right? I mean, that. hopefully you do. Um, the first service, I actually said, we tell them to brush our teeth Made that a little awkward, you know. Did you get that? Okay, I'll let that sit for a second. But, but we, we make them brush their teeth. We make them make their bed. We, 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 we tell them that they, they need to do their homework. We tell them, you have to go to school. Like, we tell them these things. But for some reason, when it comes to church, we want them to just kind of figure it out on their own, so much so that we don't provide them a place or tell them to go. You see why it's a sensitive topic? But here's the thing. This is a place they need to be. They need to hear about God's love. And not just here, but they need to have those conversations at home. We need to prepare a place. I love that we have kids at Rush here. Like they they have tournaments on the weekends and so their their parents are flying down I-5 just to get them here on Sunday nights and their parents or kids are coming in 10 minutes late on Wednesday night and they have their soccer stuff on. They're like, I'm so sorry. You know, it's like, it's totally fine. Just as cool that you're here. I love that kids are rushing here. Lastly, train it. Train it. Train your kids in faith. For Samuel 3, 9. Eli says to Samuel, say this, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. We need to train it. Some suggestions is maybe nightly Bible reading. Um, maybe, that, maybe that's an avenue to take. Maybe that's a road to take. Um, nightly Bible reading. Um, I'm a sports guy, and so when I'm watching sports or whatever, um, it's really hard when my seven-year-old walks over with his action Bible. like, Dad, can we read? You know, I'm like, Okay, so I do what people do, pause, you know. <laughs> but, but I make that connection and I read the Bible with my kids. Nightly Bible reading, maybe family prayer. 
Now, here's the thing. I know that when kids get older, it's harder to do those things. I, I understand that when you have a teenager, I have one, and I have a daughter who thinks she is. Like, I have one, and so it is, it is difficult to have those. And, and so maybe instead of doing those things every night, maybe you're having these heart-to-heart -heart talks about what's going on in their life and how to help them along the way. Orange is a child's curriculum, and they did a study that churches have just about one to two hours a week of influence in, in the life of a kid. And uh, um, the school has about 28 to 30, that's excluding extracurricular activities and sports and stuff like that, um, 28 to 30 hours a week with kids. Um, and you and I have 78 to 82 hours a week with kids. Now, I know as they get older, things change, they work, and they have, you know, things like that, but, but especially the young guys, like, you have a lot more time with them. And, and Paul, Pastor Paul, has a Paulism, that's what I call it. He, he said, we need to have a Home Depot revival. You can do it, we can help. We have a tendency to, to outsource everything. It's like, when I don't know anything about this, Go to the library. When I don't know anything about how to do this problem or whatever, sh go to school. When I don't know anything about Jesus or anything like that, or I, know, I don't know too much, sh go to church. Like, we have a tendency to outsource everything instead of helping our kids grow their faith while we grow our arm. We're working together. We're learning this together. Please don't outsource. Quantity leads to quality in conversations with kids. We have a saying in our house. Um, I don't know if this happens in yours. You ask, it doesn't have to be your own kid. You ask any kid, why'd you do this? They always say, I don't know. Anybody deal with that, right? It's just, I don't know. Apparently these kids don't know anything. <laughs> and so I always say, no, you know. You're smart and you're intelligent. Let's talk about it. Quantity leads to quality. Talk to your kids. It takes time. And sometimes it takes longer than I want it to but they need it. So do these kids. All of these kids need some, some quantity time. A great place to start, um, October 16th and 23rd is Love and Logic. Um, you guys probably didn't know I was doing announcements too, <laughs> um, is Love and Logic. If you're interested on how to raise kids, and it doesn't have to be your own kid, it's just on your Connect card, just write Love and Logic. Uh, most training needs to come from home with the church's help. Lastly, sec, almost lastly, do your kids have an opportunity to share what is God is doing or saying? Do your kids have an opportunity to share what God is saying? In verses 12 through 14 in 1 Samuel 3, God reveals himself. And then God tells, e or excuse me, Samuel, some of the things that Eli has done as a father, or some of the things that his, his sons have done. And so after he had this conversation, Eli shows up to Samuel and was like, so what did God say? Oh, nope. You know, kind of be like, uh, you know, I'm not going to, nope. Don't, you know, I have a pretty nice place here. You know, I'm afraid you're going to just kick me out, you know, kind of thing. And, and, but, but Eli says this. He says, don't hide it. Do we have those conversations with kids? Do we say, don't hide it? Tell me. Tell me what's going on in your world. Do we give our kids an opportunity to share? Lastly, this generation is responsible for the next. I don't care if you're a parent. I don't care if you're a grandparent. I don't care if you're a great-grandparent. I don't care if you just attend the church. Maybe your kids aren't here. Maybe they live in a different state, different county, different city. Maybe your kids have passed away before you. Whatever. This generation is responsible for the next. We need to love kids. We need to get to their level. We need to talk to them, not at them. Love them well. This generation is responsible for the next. That's why we do child dedication, because it's not just to see the cute babies on the stage and the cute baby pictures on the screen, but it's also on us to help the parents raise the kid because they need help. One of my visions for Family Church is that we become a community that's for the community. So we may not know much about a certain sport, but we're going to be the coach. We're, we're going to go and we're going to volunteer our time 
and hang out with some kids and get to know kids and love them. I'm going to show you a family. This is the Carter family. Um, this man here, his name is Gene. Um, at 22 years old, he was able to finally grow a beard. <laughs> I'm still working on it. And so um, he was able to grow a beard, and ever since he was 22, he referred to himself as old man. So when I say old man, it's not in a bad way. That's just who he is. This is old man Carter. And then this person over here, uh, this is my high school graduation picture, but um, that is Mama Carter. Um, she's also known as Mama C. These people are not biological for me. Old man was my basketball coach when I was in sixth grade. And I got to know um, his, his son. His name is Ben. Um, students here that come on Sunday night, they affectionately know him as Bingo. This is Bingo's parents. And um, if it was not for the Carter family loving me, I wouldn't be standing here before you. They showed me who Jesus was. They invited me in. I ate dinner with them, became a massive Chicago Bears fan because of them. And uh, I am who I am today, mostly because of them. You know, there's God, obviously, but mostly because of their love for me. Are you a Carter family to someone? Are you a Carter family to someone? They were my parents, but they weren't my parents. They hung out with me. They went to my games. They loved me, and I wasn't their kid. I'm not the only one. There are dozens of other kids that they look to Mama Carter, an old man, as their spiritual family. So if you have kids and they have friends, are you their Carter family? If there are kids in your neighborhood, are you their Carter family? Are you able to love a child that's not your own? Next steps. Choose a child to pray with or for. Choose a child to pray with, with or for. Get to know some kids. If you don't know anybody, any of them, contact me. I, I know about 300 kids in this area. That's not an over-exaggeration. I know about 300 kids in this area. There are plenty of kids that need somebody to love them, that need somebody to pray with them. And if you, you're not a kid person, that's cool. You probably pray though, right? So connect with me. I will hook you up with a kid that needs prayed for. Lastly, have a conversation with a child to help draw them closer to Jesus. Kids love, absolutely love stories. I think that's partially why they come on Sunday and Wednesday nights because I always tell a story, but kids love stories. And one of the favorite stories they love to hear is how your life was changed by Jesus, who you were before and who you are now, and who you're still trying to be like. It's not like you have arrived. Tell them your story. Have that conversation. Send a, a text, call, whatever, a kid or, or, or somebody younger than you. I'm praying for you. I'm believing in you. I love you. It changes their world. Let me pray. God, thank you for Sundays. Thank you for Saturdays. Thank you for this chance to be here with you. God, as heavy as this message is and as awkward some of the points were, God, I pray for each child in here. We have fifth, uh, fourth, fifth graders in here up to high school. For each child in here that they find you, help us as parents to Help our kids find you on their own, but giving them a way to find you, to have those conversations, to, to encourage them to come to youth group, to encourage them to come on Wednesday night. God, for the parents in this room, I pray that you give them this boldness of knowing you and this humbleness of seeking you daily. That, that we just don't know everything, so help us find you every day and for the grandparents and great-grandparents in here. God, I pray that they love their grandkids so abundantly. 
that when their grandkids talk about grandma and they talk about grandpa, all they see and all they think about is you because they love so well. And for the parents in this room that are not parents, let them know they're right where they need to be. Let them know that there are plenty of kids that just need to be loved on, plenty of kids that just need more Jesus in their life. So God, thank you. Thank you for you and what you're doing. Be in us, work through us. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us this week, Uh, a message about parenting. And we all struggle in parenting, so if you have any questions, feel free to email me at jeremy.folds at fcmail.org. If you have any questions about the service or anything, you can also email at info at familychurchweb.com. Now, a couple challenges we'd like to have for you. If um, you are in the area, we would love to connect with you. So please come to church and just kind of connect with us. That would be so great. If you are out of the area, we'd like to also challenge you to uh, find a group of people to watch this service uh, together. So have a great week, and we will see you hopefully soon.